Hello watch enthusiasts and welcome to this week's episode of the Watch Chronicler podcast. Today I have a very interesting guest and this is Nicholas Bowman Scargill from Fears. Now Fears is one of the oldest British brands uh, in existence. It was resurrected five years ago by Nicholas as a family member of the family which used to run the brand. And so there's an interesting story behind this brand and I think it's one which a lot of people know. But today I'll be speaking to him about the future of Fears. Uh, special editions potentially coming up with the 175th anniversary of the brand coming next year, as well as general discussions about British watches, British design, and about the way in which you go about sourcing a watch and what he's learned from manufacturing a watch in a very interesting price range. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you have any questions for either of us, do leave your comments in the, in the comments section down below if you're listening to this on YouTube, and do bear in mind that you can listen to this elsewhere, on any uh, podcast platform you might know of, uh, because it, you will be able to find it there. But without any further ado, welcome to Nicholas, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome, Nicholas. So thank you very much for uh, for joining me on the Watch Chronicler podcast. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure a pleasure to talk with you today. No, it's 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 fantastic to have you on the podcast because I've uh, we, we've uh, we first spoke about uh, well, I, I suppose around the the middle of last year, I would imagine. Um, but um, I remember being being rather impressed by uh, by the Brunswick you were wearing that day, um, and so it's it's been nice to see progress and advances and, and new pieces since then. I'm thinking back. It was was it the launch of the Christopher Ward for it Trident? Was. It yes, was. Yes, that was yes. when we first met. I, that was a hilarious evening because I wasn't meant to go along to it, even though I'm good friends with Mike Franz. Yes, um, but. The person I was drinking with beforehand said, oh, I'm going off to this. Why don't you just come along as my plus one? So I came along and sort of went along to it. And it was such a fun evening. It was lovely to be in a room full of so many supporters of Christopher yes. Ward. Yes. Well, I, I, it, it was a very enjoyable evening, nicely placed as well. Um, and uh, no, interesting to see, see all, all, all a, well, a variety of watches, whether they were Christopher Ward or, uh, or other brands present um, on the wrists of, of uh, those attending. But which fears are you wearing today? So today I'm wearing a Brunswick Midas, which right. is our golden watch. Um, yes. And it's a watch we only make five of a year. So it's very rare for me to actually have the opportunity to wear one because mm. usually we make them and they've all gone. But this is the pre-production for the 2020 batch. So I'm wearing it just to make sure, you know, everything is even and correct and finished right. So it's it's been a real pleasure to be wearing a gold watch again. And actually, that, 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 that raises quite an interesting question, is how many of the Brunswicks do you produce a year across all three variants which you, you have in the range? So we produce uh, just under 200 watches a year. I see. So we're, we're talking, you know, very low numbers. Right from the Brunswick Midas, we make five a year. Yes. That's it. It's, I've always uh, rather cheekily said it's not limited edition. Hmm. It's just limited production. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is, you know, if we were to make an additional five Midases, that would be at the expense of about 30 steel watches. That's how much more time consuming the gold watch is to make. So mm -hmm. as a result, we limit the production on that. And then with with the uh, the white and the blue dial, at the moment, they're very much sort of 50-50. Um, the blue dial only launched at the end of last year, but has very quickly become a, a firm favourite in the collection. Yes. And do you see do you see people um, coming back to buy a second fears once they have their first? Very much so. I, I I've always been rather surprised by it because if you look at any sort of business textbook, they'll always say you know repeat customers are are, are the best because you haven't got to pay for acquiring them and all of this. But I've always been of the the sort of thing of like, no, you want loads of new people, new people mm. discovering the brand, new people discovering our watches. So I was very shocked at first when people suddenly were buying a second watch or a third. And actually, uh, we have one owner who owns eight Fears watches. Um, yes. And, you know, but the thing is, with I very quickly realized is that when people buy a Fears, A, we, we've never had a watch returned. No one's asked mm. for a refund, which is pretty much unheard of. Yes. In, in not just the watch industry, but any any industry selling a product, um, especially one where you're selling it online. So very rarely do people get to handle the watch before they, they purchase it. But also, and this is a point I'm particularly proud of, is no one has sold on their fears. 
Hmm. So, you know, they may, when people decide to downsize their collection or consolidate it to a few pieces, other watches go, but the fears doesn't go. And to me, that is, that's really special. You know, when I'm talking to some of our owners and they have, you know, 40, 50, 100 watch collections and some of the pieces are incredible. I mean, we're talking not only high-end, you know, halterology, but also high-end independence. And the Fears is relatively inexpensive, and yet it's a watch they often wear most days. Hmm. You know, it's not a beta watch. A Brunswick isn't a, you know, a field watch with a sandblasted case. You know, it is a very elegant, understated watch. But it's also not a dress watch. You know, it's that old-fashioned category of just watch. Yes. And, you know, I think people quite like that. You know, it's a watch you put on, you can wear it, you can enjoy it. You're not going to go scuba diving in it. You're not going to go up a mountain in it, but you also don't have to be in a, you know, in a tuxedo or you don't have to be, you know, formally dressed. You can wear it with jeans or you can wear it with a suit or just it, you can wear it any time, really. No, but it's, it's an interesting point you say about it just being a watch in the old fashioned sense, because it, it is true that we're, we're often led down different routes in terms of choosing what sort of watch you want and just having just being furnished with something to wear and enjoy on a daily basis is is not a priority which is often made and so it's interesting to see uh, the way you position yourself um, as a um, as a brand and you, you've touched on who the uh, the the ideal um, customer uh, or, or who, who, who your customers uh, who your group of customers involves and includes um, who is your, your your the average person who buys a fierce watch because of course you've changed a bit in the last few months since February as you no longer have quartz watches uh, has this affected your customers so it has slightly, but mm. right from the off, I always said I didn't want to pigeonhole or, or focus too much on one direction of who would buy a Fears watch. Yes. Um, I think there's some, some, some quotes I made back in 2016 when I restarted mm. the company um, and where I basically say that, look, if you've got a wrist and you can afford it, you're a potential owner of a Fears. Mm. And... I think that having that idea is, is not a bad way to go. You know, for example, we've never gendered our watches. You know, no. I've never said the Fears watch is for men or for women. It's just a watch. And in fact, you know, I think it's about a quarter of our owners of new Fears watches are, are women. Mm. And, you know, at the end there, 38 millimeter watch looks looks good on pretty much any wrist you know obviously if it's 48 millimeters you might be saying well it's probably a little more suited to men and and of that probably men of a, of a larger build but yes. no I, i've i've always been of the opinion no you don't do that you don't also try and say wearing this watch will make you an astronaut or a scuba diver or a motorbike rider or any of that just say look this watch will make you a better version of yourself because mm. you'll just feel like you're wearing a beautiful object and Anyone can appreciate that. Um, but in terms of the, the change, I thought, um, you know, leading up to February, I was a bit nervous, you know, because quite a lot of people had seen Fears as being, you know, a sub thousand pound quartz Swiss made brand. And then over the last couple of years, we've very much changed and we're now a 3,000 pound hand built in Britain mechanical brand. And What's been nice is we didn't just one day stop, but also, and, and swap from one to the other. We've done it gradually. Also, a lot of those first owners have actually then gone on to buy the mechanical Brunswick, but also vice versa. So we've had quite a few people purchase three, four thousand pound Brunswick. And then a few months later say, ooh, do you have one of those quartz ones? Because I rather fancy that as my sort of, you know, I can just chuck that on and wear it anywhere. And, hmm. you know, they, they appreciate the, the reliability of the quartz. And I think what's nice is I realized very early on, people weren't just buying the watch because of, you know, how it looked on a spec table. Oh, hmm. what, what bang for what buck am I going to get? No, no. I think they realized quickly that actually, you know, a Fears watch, even with the quartz ones, they're not, they're not cheap watches. Fears doesn't hmm. make a cheap watch. It's always about the hidden finishing, the, the subtle details. Um, in fact, earlier today, I was chatting to my, um, 
my doll maker in Germany. We, we yes. work with one of the world's best doll makers. Mm. And on the watch we launched in the summer, the, the Redcliffe Streamline, which was a mm. limited edition quartz watch, which we sold for uh, under 500 pounds. Mm. The dial on that, I always knew the dial on that was technically too good for a watch of that price. I mean, yeah, it, re it really was an exceptional dial. Anyway, they were, they were explaining to me today uh, about actually the, all these additional processes they had to do to achieve the exact shade of antique silver that I wanted for that dial. And I hadn't realized the dial went through several different galvanic layers of coloring. And then right at the end, they did a very light plating of uh, 2N gold to give it that sort of antique color. Because it did have a funny like, like sort of color to it. Yes, it was like a patinaed silver dial, almost like yeah. a gilt sort of dial. And I thought, wow, all those people who paid £483 for a streamline, they probably <laughs> don't realise their dial actually has real gold on it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the thing, you know. And so for me, there's, there isn't one typical or target owner. For me, I've always gone on the basis that if you like the watch and it suits who you are, then, then it's the right watch for you. Um, you know, looking back on the sort of the heritage of Fears, and we're very lucky to be one of Britain's oldest watch companies, yes. um, older than Smith's even. And what's quite nice to see is the kind of watches Fears made then and who they were made for is very much who we're positioned today at. You know, Fears didn't make um, dress watches. It didn't make uh, high complications. You didn't find minute repeater you know, watches in the, in the brochure from the, you know, the fifties the and sixties. Um, but also it, it made some tool watches, but it didn't specialize in that area. Um, so for me, it's quite nice to sort of make sure that what we make today is not only in keeping with our heritage, but also is, you know, slowly, you know, owning our little area of elegant everyday watches. That's, that's, it, it, it's very interesting to hear that, um, that, that particular approach because it, it doesn't sound the same as you hear from a lot of brands but bearing in mind your history and if memory serves the, pr the price of the streamline was it was the inflated version of the original price was it not correct yes yeah. so the watch was inspired by a model from the 1946 collection which was mm. the fears centenary having been founded in 1846 and I particularly liked the model. It was the, the streamlined model for gentlemen. It was wonderfully advertised. And I liked the dial design. I liked the sort of gilt numerals, the shape of the number four in particular. I, was, I want to recreate a modern version of that. You know, it, it will always be our most sort of vintage style watch. You know, I'm very, very much focused on not just creating vintage watches. We create today what I envisage fears would have been making today if it hadn't closed in 1976 so mm. i said right i'm going to make this watch you know vintage style it's a limited edition of 100 pieces it's celebrating the first thousand days of the company being restarted because actually as a small business you've got to mark these little occasions these little milestones mm. and i thought right we're, we're borrowing its design what if we borrowed its price hmm. so it used to retail in 1946 in old money for 11 pounds, two shillings and sixpence. Yes. And I, you know, when you think, I wonder what, what is that in modern money? Like, let's just see who, who was this watch aimed at? You know, what sort of price was this? And when you decimalize it and then convert it after 73 years of inflation in, in mm -hmm. the UK, it came out at 483 pounds, including tax. And I thought, you know what? That is certainly less than I want to be selling the watch for, <laughs> but I rather like it. It's a random number. And actually, you know what? Not every watch you sell has to, you know, has to make much or if any profit, you know, actually, let's just do this as a one off thing and link it intrinsically to its uh, its forebearer. And so, yes, we, we ended up selling it for the same price as the 1946 original, uh, just adjusted for 73 years of inflation. It's a very interesting concept, and certainly it, 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 uh, it drew a lot of attention. I suppose if another brand had launched something with the, the, the same specifications, that's not going into detail about the, as you say, about the dial details um, and about the care taken to manufacture it, you wouldn't have 
thought that there would be as much buzz around it. But I heard from a, a surprising number of people about it at the time. Um, and finally seeing one um, in, in the metal um, last year was, was very eye-opening. It was a, a very interesting piece to look at um, and, and something different, something which uh, appealed to a customer which I hadn't considered. So it, it was an exciting piece. Uh, and I suppose a very nice way to mark a change in times as you move from, from quartz to an altogether mechanical approach to watchmaking. But this is a question which I suppose draws us back to the question about the, uh, the dials and our discussion about the dial, because the manufacturing of, of your watches is something which has changed somewhat. I remember hearing you speak about the Brunswick and how between batches this, the places of manufacturing had changed. What have you learned from the manufacturing of your watches over the last few years to, to bring fears forward in terms of quality and, and uh, uh, details? Well, it's very interesting you mentioned that about the Brunswick because there is, you know, we don't call it this, but there is a difference between in the Brunswick white model mm. between the sort of Mark I and the Mark II. Yes. And the Mark I had a dial and case that were both made in the UK, mm. um, whereas the Mark II has a dial and case which are both made in Germany. Yes. And interesting point to say, when I say they're made in Germany, they're actually made in Germany because quite often when people say, oh, this is made in Switzerland or this is made in Germany, it's, it's technically a PO box because yeah. it's actually made in China. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I've always believed in transparency, which is why on the website, we always list everywhere that has made a part. So our sapphire glasses are made in Hong Kong. You know, they are made in China because you can't get them made in Switzerland bar one company. Um, so if we go back to 2017, when I was developing the, the Brunswick, mm -hmm. you know, we were prototyping it and we needed to make a case, a dial. So we made those in the UK, um, close to home. We could do a one-off piece. And so we thought, right, well, let's actually market this with, with that sort of, you know, as close to made in Britain as possible. The hands are made in Britain and they still are today. You know, we make the hands in house, um, mm -hmm. So we thought, right, let's do all that, great. But I, um, I, I was thinking, is that necessarily going to produce the best watch? Now it produced a very, very good watch. However, it's not a sustainable way to sell a watch unless you're going to be charging, you know, considerably more. Yes. Um, you know, the amount of time, energy and effort that went into each watch case was just it was phenomenal and it also there was no easy way to scale it we knew there was going to be a limit to how many watches were going to be possible each year yes. and that wasn't going to allow the business to grow now look i don't want to grow at a rapid pace i don't believe in growth at all other cost but i also believe in the business needs to survive it needs to thrive and, you know, if I want this business to still be around in 50 years time for me to hand on to the fifth managing director, I, I it needs to be bigger than just, you know, me. And I'm pleased to say we, we now have a small team of people. So that, mm. that that's great. But that then led me to look at it and go, right, if we want to make this, you know, more sustainable, how do we do that? And I'm not talking about sustainable from an environmental standpoint. I'm meaning sustainable in a in a way that we can actually produce more than 60, 70 watches a year. Yeah. So I was very kindly introduced to uh, the case and dial manufacturer who I work with in Germany um, through another British watch company. Um, most British watch firms actually talk to each other. You know, mm -hmm. there are a few exceptions, um, but most of us will chat to each other and, and offer advice and, and, you know, and help when we need to look for suppliers. And, when I started talking to these companies and, and seeing what, who they produced for and what, you know, the quality they produced for and realizing that actually I could bring that to fears, I was like, actually, this, this is the way forward. Um, and you could say, oh, well, you know, a downside is it's no longer made in, made in Britain. Mm -hmm. But I very much, I mean, we build our watches in Britain. We do a lot of the finishing and we do the final assembly and everything in, in, here in the UK. And that's important to me because that links to the heritage and also, you know, a British watch, I believe, should be should be made that way. But in terms of where the components are made, it's more important that they are made bespoke to your design, 
it's much more complicated, expensive and time consuming to build a watch the way we do, which is working with individual component manufacturers. You know, one company makes the crown, one mm. makes the glass, one makes the seals, one makes the case, one makes the dial, one makes the hands, you know, and then they all come together. And, you know, this is why I'm wearing a pre-production watch at the moment on my wrist as we speak. Mm. It's because you need to make sure that when everything does come all together, it actually works. It actually fits. It actually, you know, assembles and is a proper watch. Um, you know, and I, I'm very pleased with the watch that we made today. You know, this, we're talking during the, the lockdown in the UK for the coronavirus. Yeah. And, you know, this is a weird time because I usually, at least once a month, will be on doing a day trip to Germany or Switzerland to meet my, mm. meet my suppliers. And it feels weird having to deal with them over the phone or over video <laughs> conference, um, especially with the language difference. You know, it's much Imagine. easier to... Ex well, if you imagine you're sat there in a room and you can spend like three hours discussing one shade of blue and yeah. it's really easy to show it and everyone's not looking at, you know, oh, is it an RGB colour code? or No, you're looking at the same physical thing. So you all know what you're looking at. Um, and with the language difference, it's easier to describe how things are made using your hands. You know, mm. for me, it's always about working with people who are experts and the best in their field you know the dial maker only make dials yes and they make dials for incredible companies you know most of bond street brands and yes. a lot of the high-end independents and so if they can't make it it probably can't be done mm. and what's so exciting is seeing them getting fired up about talking about different ways of doing the lacquer on the brunswick white or when we did the Brunswick Blue, talking about the processes and having to find new ways of doing different finishes together. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm a geek at heart. <laughs> so I just love being in a room, watching someone getting excited about not their profession, but their passion. Mm. And that results in a better watch, I believe. Well, it's a wonderful thing about the, the, the watch industry is there are people who really do... Um, who, who are, 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 are fascinated by that which they do every day, by their, their profession, their trade, whether it's a small part of a watch, whether it's um, assembling a watch, whether it's producing the dial, the hands, each part. And, and this is a wonderful aspect which ne needs to be protected, I think. Um, and, and actually, the one aspect which I've been keen to, to ask you about, because following what, what you've just said, the, the manufacturing has, has changed, but how do you find um, watchmaking is in the UK at the moment? Because I understand that um, the position of, of the watchmaker um, in England has been a, a changing one over the past few years. Well, what's your experience been with watchmaking in the UK? It's very interesting in the UK because uh, I think the UK is maybe at fault of always looking backwards. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm British. I, I was born and bred in London. Um, I run, you know, one of Britain's oldest watch companies, um, yeah. you know, my blood runs in the in the colours of the Union Jack. You know, I am I'm as British as, as they come. However, I've always a company I've always admired. Now, admittedly, they are owned by a, a German um, parent company. Is yeah. Rolls Royce. Mm. Rolls Royce motor cars is fantastic because it is completely British in the way it does things, in its understatement, its elegance, all of that but it very rarely looks backwards. Occasionally they'll do a special edition and, and look backwards, but usually everything is looking forward, creating something modern and new, whereas their yeah. competitors, uh, Bentley, are much more about their heritage. And I think this is a thing in Britain, we're always looking backwards. And what can be a fault with that is, when it comes to watchmaking, everyone goes on about, you know, Harrison and, oh, and the automatic winding mechanism and all these, you know, all these different yeah. uh, elements of the modern watch that Britain created. And I go, great, but we didn't perfect them. We didn't perfect making watches. You know, Switzerland is the number one. That's what people want to have on their wrist. You know, actually, what we should look at today is not just the, you know, the dream of creating a you know, British movement. Wonderful. That's great. Actually, what I would like to see us do is create a British tractor movement, something like an ETA 2824, you know, yes. because that requires so much more skill, so much more technology. Mm. Um, you know, the closest we have to something like that would be the Christopher Ward SH-21. Yes. Um, 
but you know that was largely developed in in, in Switzerland and you know it's manufactured there but you know that that i think is as close to that as possible no what when it comes to british watchmaking today you know we've got watchmakers they're fantastic that's great mm. other countries do as well but i think britain does have something special and unique mm. and i was recently chatting about this to um uh to, to another british watchmaker who yes. very kindly agreed with me and they were basically my, my premise was it's british design and style and when I say that, I'm not talking about the E-Type Jaguar or the red telephone box or the black London cap. Yeah, I'm not talking about those British icons. No, no, no. What I'm referring to is how something can have a British look to it. So, mm. you know, if you look at something like a, a Nomos or a Lange or a Glashütte, you know, yes. original, um, they're German. They look German. They do mm. not look Swiss. And... I'm in awe of them for that. You don't need to see the made in Germany proudly printed at the bottom of the dial. You just look at it and it has a sort of Teutonic vibes irradiating from yes. it. And I think that's fantastic. The same with American watches. You know, if you look at American watches today, you know, whether it's everything from Shinola through to um, uh, some of the incredible bespoke pieces being made in California, Yes. You know, they, they really have a look to them, which is very American. And it's, I love it. Again, a lot of Swiss watches have a Swiss look to them. And, you know, we look at different countries and, and it goes on from there. I think in Britain, what we really should be doing from today going forward is going right. What is the British look? And that doesn't mean that I have to sit down in a big conference hall with the other, you know, 20, 30 odd British brands, and we all, you know, sign a document as a cartel saying it's got to be like this. No, 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 not at all. I believe it should be a case of us going, we as British companies, what do we, what do we see in our past that we can bring forward? So, you know, how movements are finished. Um, a criticism levied at the Brunswick Blue when it launched was it has uh, Cote de Genève on the, on the plates, on the bridges. Yes. Um, which I've always been a fan of. But the journalist said, and I, I had, I agreed with him actually, he said, this is nice, that's fine. I'd like to see something more British, more distinctive, mm -hmm. something special. And actually you look at it, look at pretty much all the old British pocket watches and including the ones made by Fiat. And yes. you've got those wonderfully frosted plates with mm -hmm. a frosting that is, you know, you, you know, you can almost see it shimmering. And you also, the shape of the plates, and they've, they've got a certain look to them that at first is very plain. But what makes it British is the fact that actually it's all in the details of finishing, the little bevels, the little curves that have a, a sort of graceful elegance to them. And this is something I noticed when I looked back at what Fears made over its 130 years before it closed. It wasn't just using certain things like the shape of hands that we use today or the logo that we use today. Yeah, yeah that, that's obvious. No, it's looking at all these things and appreciating what was the common thread. And actually, it was a common thread used by a lot of British watches from the time. You know, if you look at Smith's, they have a distinctive look. At first, it looks yes. like, you know, any sort of uh, field star watch. But no, 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 they have a distinctive look. And... For me, that is important, creating the modern British look. So that just as you look at, uh, you know, uh, Langer or Nomos and you took the name off the dial, not only could you say the brand, you could say the country. Yes. Um, I would love it in, you know, the next few years that you could get to a point that with British brands, big or small, that you look at it and you go, oh, yeah, no, that looks like a British watch because of the subtle differences or because of certain proportions or certain use of typography or, you know, it's important for everyone to have an individual brand. But I just feel that, you know, we, we have that, that heritage of having had a distinctive look. So why today am I falling guilty of this as well? Going, oh, Cote de Genève looks beautiful. Yeah, great. We already had our thing, <laughs> you know, we already had our look, you know, Glashütte have a different kind of stripe. The German yes. stripe is far wider. Um, so yes, that was a very, a very long answer to a very, very short question. But I think modern British watchmaking is very strong and alive, but I think for it to really thrive, we need to look beyond having, you know, in-house British movements or 
mm. making as many parts in Britain as possible. That's fine. It's a little obvious. What's more difficult is the subtlety that actually Britain excels at. It's, it's very interesting, actually, that you raise these points about the, the British aesthetic or the British approach to things. And certainly there's a, there, is a, there was a sense of quality as well from a, a British object, from something produced in Britain, whether it was a watch or anything else. There was a sense of quality. This is a, a fundamental point which I think is, um, sh should be at the heart of, of an aesthetic. But the fact that you're looking for a, a particular look for a, a British watch, I think, is, is, a, is a very appealing one. I think one which watchmaking in, in, in England and the UK in general is, is going to need in coming years because there is certainly an interest. So getting this look, this appeal, um, which has been perfected in other countries, um, perhaps I think the best example I can think of of one country having a particular look which is actually codified uh, would perhaps be Japan with um, the, the Tanaka essential rule book for designing a watch, which seems to be be observed sixty years after after first being produced, um, which, which which I think is is remarkable. Well, there's um, I was reading a book uh, years and years ago about British design from nineteen forty to nineteen eighty, and of course it included all the obvious icons, but it also included some things you know not so obvious, like uh, the Kenneth Grange designed Kenwood mixer. Um, yes. he, he famous, obviously, for the redesign of the high-speed train or the InCity 125. Um, but one of the things that the, the book just casually mentioned, and it wasn't trying to make a point around this, this, this uh, quote, but it said, British design sensibility of graceful yet purposeful function. Hmm. And I think that that's exactly it. And that's what you said about that sort of reliability, that sturdiness. Yes. But... It's got those little little quirks, that little you know, that little twist of gracefulness that makes it not as cold and Teutonic as say you know the difference is look at a modern day Jaguar versus a you know a, a BMW. And, yes. and I think a BMW is beautiful cars. You know, I, I'd happily accept a seven series any time of the day, mm. but it looks very different from an XJ. You know, they are they're both going for the same market. But they one looks incredibly British and one looks incredibly German, and I think that's the thing. They both got that sort of reliable, you know, that that you know, sort of uh, sophisticated, solid, dependable look. But the British one just has those extra graceful curves and little quirks. It's you know, look at a Savile Row suit. You know, mm. the cut of it. Yes, it will vary from from house to house, but fundamentally, you can tell a British suit from you know from an Italian or American or yes. you know, because. Exactly. There were just different little differences, and I just wish in the watch industry we we did a bit more of that. I think, you know, not only the international collector, but I think the domestic collector. You know, at the end of the day, you want to own a British watch, not just because you're British and it's made in Britain. No, you want to own it because it, a, it's beautiful. It, it's something you want to own. B, it's well made, and you know, obviously you know, good, good value for the price, which doesn't mean cheap. It just means good value for the amount you've paid. But I think there should also be a thing of going, well, actually in a collection, yes, you know, people want to have a dive watch or they want a sports watch or a dress watch or a plane watch or a chrono watch. They want different types of watches. Well, actually, I think if you really look at a lot of true collectors and enthusiasts, they also go, well, I really want that sort of more rugged American style. But I also have one which is much more, you know, Teutonic, and then I have a classic Swiss style or a Japanese style. Actually, you, you look, and there'll be lots of different, and it's not just the brand, but it's the look and the feel of it. And I think that's where Britain really could excel, is if it just accepted that it does already have a look, it just needs to maybe sort of stick to it a little more and kind of promote the British look. Mm. Well, with that in mind, actually, we're, we're coming to an important anniversary for the Fears brand, or perhaps two in 2021, um, because it is the 175th anniversary and the fifth, I believe. Yes, yes. And I think that's, that's a wonderful point to make. I'm really pleased you've made that because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always talking about Fears being one of Britain's oldest, but it's also one of Britain's youngest watch companies, you know, because... Yes. You know, uh, when I restarted it in 2016 on the 170th anniversary, I was very, very aware, having worked in the industry for, for many years, just how many watch brands launch and then disappear after either the first year 
or the first one or two watch collections. Yes. You know, when we launched Brunswick Blue, that was our 12th model we had launched um, across a limited range of families, but, you know, in terms of different colors and, and variants. And actually, yeah, getting to five years is a real, for me, will be a huge sense of achievement. Um, mm -hmm. But also, I mean, 175 years, what a beautiful anniversary. I mean, yes. 200 is fine, but people can mistype it as 100. But 175, 175, it's just got such a, well, I mean, Fizz was founded when Queen Victoria had only been on the throne for nine years. She was still <laughs> in her, she was still in her 20s. Like, yes. it wasn't the early Victorian period. It was the beginning of the Victorian period, you know. Um, I think the year before was when GMT was adopted for the railways you know, mm -hmm. standardizing the UK railway yes. network. Um, and so, yes, next year is going to be very significant. And I, I won't lie, I'm kind of glad that next year is next year and not this year. It would have been, look, I mean, without dwelling too much on it, obviously the, there are a lot of horrible things happening right now. And, you know, so be it, if it had been this year, I would have just accepted it and moved on. But, you know, I do feel as, as an anniversary like that, it shouldn't be overlooked, you know, it should be sort of recognised and, you know, appreciated. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, certainly from uh, from the records which other brands have set, I mean, if we look at um, Patek's 175th anniversary, um, we, we can see the amount of care they put into, into that with the Grandmaster Chime. Um, but uh, without giving anything away, do you have anything in mind? Well, other than a uh, dual face perpetual tourbillon <laughs> minute repeater, um, other, other than that, made in house entirely in Britain. Um, no, <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, no, we, we are working on, we're working on a, a few different projects. Um, one of them is uh, a watch, mm. one of them is not a watch. Um, and the third one is we've managed to track down the final premises in Bristol, where the company closed in 1976. Wow. And today it's a, a very trendy bike shop and restaurant uh, bar. So I'm hoping that we will be doing a whole range of celebrations there, you know, mm -hmm. marking the fact that, you know, 45 years before the business had closed and there we are reopening. Um, I'm not sure if we'll make as big a deal about the five-year anniversary. I, I, th I, I would like to think we will have things for that. I think the 175th is, um, is, is the bigger one that I'm, I'm focusing on at the moment, just because we've had to start. We started a few of those projects um, last year, actually, because mm -hmm. they take a very long time to, to develop. Um, I won't go into too much details. I think, you know, it, it will be a huge shock to people uh, to realise that maybe a watch related project could be limited to a certain significant number of pieces. Uh, yeah. Big surprise there. Mm. Um, I mean, 175 was made for a limited edition, but okay. and I'm, I'm not a massive fan of limited editions. I think it's too easy to, to do too many of them. But I think something like this, you need to do something one off, keep it special. Um, but we, we, we'll see what it looks like. <laughs> well, that's fantastic to hear. And it's been a real pleasure to, uh, to speak to you today. I'm sure that all of the listeners will, will have enjoyed um, this discussion. But thank you very much for, um, for joining me on the Watch Chronicler podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Anyway, I'll conclude the podcast there. But if you enjoyed this podcast, then do follow us and like, share and subscribe. Also, head over to watchchronicler.com to be able to catch all the latest information about watch releases, interesting articles and everything else watch-related here in the UK. So thank you very much for listening. This is Armand from watchchronicle.com. Out.